also happy belated Earth Day to everybody. Um, after class today, what people are sharing, I'd love to hear if anybody has stories about what they did on Earth Day, whether that's you know really lovely nature experience that you had, or maybe if you picked up trash or did any stewardship, or just poetry, whatever. So um, yeah, happy Earth Day to everybody, and thank you, Jack, for everything. Thank you. Well, thank you, and also just want to thank you again for really bringing um, the the power of stewardship into something that's fundamentally part of this community. Um, I put that at your feet. Um, thank you. The uh, you know it makes such a difference if you just do a little act of stewardship in a place that you're exploring. You feel so much connect more connection to the place. It's really, really interesting to, to, to see that. And so um, thank you for empowering people to do that. You know, and, and it's the, the, the yeah, yes, the, the problems which we're facing um, ecologically are larger than those that can be solved by individual action. Um, so I'm not saying that like if everybody picked up trash, <laughs> we just solved all their problems. No, 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 no. But what, what it is, is that when we do that, little act of service, it reminds us of a couple of things. One is that I'm not alone, that there's all these other nature journalers and others doing similar sorts of things. And also reminds me that it's through action that things get done. And I think that one of the big dangers these days is just um, apathy. Um, and, uh, and that comes, part of that comes from, there's, there's actually an intentional narrative that's being pushed at us right now that you know, the, the problems are, they're, they're just too, too big and you really can't do anything about it. Um, and uh, I think that's wrong. I think that's wrong. But if we believe that, then it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. Um, so sometimes the little action of kind of getting our cleanup on just reminds us like, I am powerful and collectively uh, we are even more powerful and um, we ought to use that on behalf of this planet. So thank you. Thank you. The, um, just, uh, you know, want, do you have any thoughts that you wanted to share just further about the idea of, of stewardship and uh, those, those sort of things? I know you've done tons of thinking about this. I do. Um, one thing is that even if you're out there by yourself and nobody's out there with you, people who are walking by you on whatever trail you that you're on will notice what you're doing. And even if they don't do anything right then and there, it'll stick in their mind that this is a thing people do. So by being out there and doing that stewardship, you're growing the culture of stewardship and making it a norm. Um, and that's, that's what, like, at first it seems abnormal to be seeing somebody out there doing the cleanup, but then the more people see each other out there doing something, the more they're inspired to do something along with you. Um, and so even if it's subconsciously in their mind at first, that's why it's important to keep getting out there and keep doing it. Um, and then after a while you get this kind of, I feel like it's a dopamine rush when you're out there doing something and cleaning up. And so you, you feel, you, you really feel better it's a really great antidote to feeling a bit depressed although if you if you look around afterwards and you see that there's still a lot of stuff that can be a bit hard something i found to deal with that is to look at the amount of stuff i've already picked up and be like this is the stuff that is no longer here littering our environment so that can help um sharing with each other can help uh yeah just everybody can do something and even if it's not trash those are the kind of stewardships you can do so Whatever thing that you do, don't discount it. You know, mm -hmm. I don't discount it. I think that's the big thing. Don't discount what you're doing. I think that is that is really that's that's really profound. Um, thank you. Thank you. Well, let's take a look at some nature journaling shenanigans. <clears throat> um, here's here's a thought today. Um, let's take a look at using colored pencils while drawing the Madison River in Montana. Right, Jan? Thumbs up on that? All right, so we can, we can <laughs> maybe we'll throw a baby goose into that. Um, but, uh, ah, so let's, let's first bring on, on Jan. Tell us a little bit about the challenge that you're facing. Hey, <laughs> good to have you with us. Um, yeah, I have... I have a lot of, of 
paintings I'm trying to do. And I find that I just want to paint a river blue that's not blue. In other words, mm -hmm. you know, there's a lot of green in it. There are even purples in it. Sometimes it's almost flat looking. What the sun does really changes it a lot. And whether there are autumn hills, because I'm working from a photograph I took last fall, um, whether there are autumn hills on one side that have yellow, amber, you know, kind of colors yeah. and deep uh, Douglas firs on the other side, you know, it makes a difference in the river. And so I just keep doing it and trying to figure out how to do it. Okay, let's 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 mess with that. And actually, we can mess with specifically the photograph that you're using. Could you email it to me? Um, for a long time, um, see, I I if I go, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go in the wayback machine and grab one of my old journals because before I started doing watercolor, um, I was using watercolor pencils. So when I was in college, that was my tool kit. I had some water. Uh, a little paintbrush and some watercolor pencils. So I'm going to get one of those old journals, and I'll show you some some drawings with that. And also, this is kind of fun. You get to see some of my my old sketchbooks. Um. So let's see. I am going to go to this cam. Hi, there it is. So um, here I am. Um, these, so these are our pen drawings with a uh, watercolor pencil on top of them. And here I'm primarily using, looks like I'm using on all these ones, the watercolor pencil just as a regular color pencil. So if you, you can, if you don't add water to the watercolor pencil, they look <laughs> just like color pencils. But this one here, if you look at it, this little beastie has, so this little one down here, if you look all this sort of interstitial spaces, you don't have the little kind of the, the kind of the grit of the pencil lines. This is all blended together because that's watercolor pencil that's been hit with watercolor. And let me see. Uh, Actually, in a bunch of these, I am, I'm not adding watercolor to it. This is one of my first uh, watercolor, actual watercolor drawings. Oh, okay, here we go. Um, so this is a watercolor pencil drawing of a little weasel. And there's, 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 there's watercolor in there. And yeah, it looks like on a lot of these, I wasn't adding water to it. I might have to, that might be in a, an older sketchbook. Let me show me somebody with, show me somebody with water. No, yeah, it looks like mostly using it as, um, as a, uh, just regular colored pencils. Um, so that wasn't the best example. Let's take a look now at watercolor pencils. So here's a set of watercolor pencils. These are Faber Castell Albrecht Durer pencils, and they come in a bunch of colors. And um, the uh, there are. Are, are more, and um, what works is that you you put down some pencil, and I'll put down some pencil of a different color. <laughs> and so you can treat it just as a as a as a regular um, pencil drawing. Um, one of the secrets of making colored pencils work for you 
is that let's say you put down uh, this green. Actually, that's the green I just put down. Um, let's put down maybe this one. Is this the one the same? Yeah. All right, you've got some green. And it's a little bit too, kind of feels a little bit out of the two Christmas tree -y to you. Um, and you want to kind of kick that, 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 that back and make it a little bit more muted. Then what you can do is you can blend colored pencils by if you haven't pressed too hard with your first pass, you can blend other colored pencils into your first set of colored pencils. All right, so you can build up here, I'm putting a little bit of purplish into this. And so you now see you have both of those colors kind of sparkling back at you. Um, similarly, I could make this one here a lighter lemony color um, by putting some yellow into it. Okay. Um, let's take a little bit of cyan or this kind of periwinkle like color, light ultramarine. And I'm going to put that into part of it. You see, you can layer colored pencils on top of each other until you get the paper so filled with kind of the wax from the pencil that it starts to kind of beat up. You see, this is getting a little bit clumpy in there. It's starting to beat up. That paper is just about at its limit. There's no more real tooth in the paper. So if I kind of start putting more layers of pencil on it, it'll just start to kind of beat up and make these weird little, you see these little, these little blotches are starting to form in it. That is pencil mark, pencil that is kind of wadded into a mass of waxy pigment. And it's just gonna start to get pushed around on the page. So eventually you can't really add more to it. So with pencils and colored pencils, the big secret is to start to layer your colors on top of each other. But watercolor pencils have this other special ability. And um, hold on a second. I just pulled out my water brush and saw that the water brush is empty. I'm going to run and fill this water brush up. You might want to fill up your water brush too at this moment. All right. <clears throat> So check this out. What I do is this is just, I'm gonna, there's, there's some pigment that was already on my brush there. So I'm going to clean it out. There, now I've got clean brush. Um, if I go into this with the, with water, it liquefies all that pigment. And the same thing here. And so I get this, um, now let's take this and I'm going to liquefy this down. And finally, I'll liquefy this part of this. All right, see, that's really cool. It's smoothed out. And, <laughs> excuse me. <coughs> Interestingly enough, once this is dry, I can actually layer more colored pencil on top of that. Um, so that's a, a really neat thing that you then you might be saying, well, what's not to like about watercolor pencils? Well, there's a couple of things here that are really actually pretty irritating. One is that this little blotch, that is a really different color than that. This is a darker, more foresty green. This is a more bright, vivid, industrial green. Right, so notice that those colors have actually, those are really different colors. Let's kind of go back to that, you know, here's the yellow. 
and we'll put some green in it. So if I think I'm going to get this color, when I hit it with the water, I'm probably going to be really surprised. Look at that. It turned much more yellowy. And also notice that, see that little green edge? A bunch of the green pigment has migrated to the edge of this and made a little green wall around where it is brighter yellow. See that the green has now got pushed up there to the edge. And you, are you seeing the same thing going on here? This has a darker green edge around it. This has a darker green edge around it. What's happening is part of that paint is migrating to the sides as I'm pushing with the water, it gets pushed off to the sides, leaving the inside more anemic and this outside ring more intense. That is a really irritating thing. And so um, let's just kind of a few more examples. I'm going to mix up here is sort of a, here's some dark reddish color and let's mix some purple into that. So I'm getting on my page what I think I want. All right, let's say that's exactly the color I want and it's exactly the value that I want. Now we're gonna come across this, oh boy. Well, first of all, all the paint's getting pushed over to the edge. I'm gonna kind of try to collect it, spread it across here. I mean, those are really different colors and different values. And I have that little bathtub ring. Wow, that's a big difference. So when I, <coughs> when I, <coughs> excuse me, when I hit colored, these colored pencils with water, there is a value shift. That means how dark or light it is changes. And there's also a color shift. And that can be really unexpected and surprising and irritating. Um, so one way of handling that is not using water with your watercolor pencils. Well, that's a bummer because you wanted to use water with your watercolor pencils, right? Um, the other is to first establish for yourself a little a color chart. And the way you do that is you take your first pencil. This one says cobalt blue. And you write. cobalt blue, in cobalt blue. And then you make yourself a little test strip. And you can do this in your journal. So take the back page of your journal and you can do this. So if you just have regular colored pencils, you can do the same thing. Um, what about this next one? This one here is light ultramarine. There's light ultramarine blue. And so I get what color it is. And I do that for all my different colors. And then hit the back half of these with water. this one here. I'm going to hit the back half of this with water. And so then I say to myself, all right, what has happened here? Okay, this one, it turned much more pale, and this one turned much more bright. This is a darker blue. This one is a more of kind of vivid blue. This one is more... <clears throat> um, so it is, it's a lighter value, it turned more vivid, and um, the, 
uh, so the saturation of the color is much more intense in you know, the cobalt blue. And the value really dropped when I hit it with water with this light ultramarine blue. I'm going to do that for all of my pencils because the bummer is that each pencil will interact with the water in a different way. But now at least I've got a chart of how to handle this. How do I handle these, these, all these differences? And I'm going to just do one more. This is the phthalo blue. Phthalo blue is often kind of the best cyan in a set of pencils. Let's see what it does here. All right, looks, it's a little, uh, yeah, rid of that little edge there. Lighter value, this is more grayish, this is more vibrant, kind of a similar reaction to the, so I now know that this one really lightens, this one, um, it's going to get brighter, you know, different pencils, they'll do their different things. But then you have in your journal a chart with the unwetted and the wetted version of every pencil that you have. Unfortunately, there are some things that this cannot predict. For instance, let's say you take the combination of phthalo blue and cadmium yellow. I wonder if this pencil actually has cadmium in it. I put those together and it makes a really nice green color. And if I hit that with water, It makes it brighter green. That's interesting, right? So <clears throat> with this, this little color chart, you're not getting all the co possible combinations of things, but it will give you a general impression of how things will start to change. So, um, the other final problem is, let's say I had a, um, I have a little drawing. And There are details on that drawing. When I hit it with water, all that careful work I did of establishing my details gets blended away. So, well, that's a bummer. So what am I going to do? There's an order of operations. And I'm going to show you just a little diagram what I basically do. <clears throat> Let's say I have some shape. And it's mostly, um, it's, there's going to be a, sort of a blue-green to it. All right. Um, I am going to color that. Might do a little test swatch off on the side to see what happens if I take this blue and I mix it with this green. And I hit that with water. All right, okay, that's the color that those two are gonna make. I don't want it to be a surprise to me 
when I um, <clears throat> when I kind of go to my my paper. Let me see. What about this green? Sorry, that blue and this green. Let's try hit that. Okay, let's say that that's the color that I like better. So I'm going to take that blue and that green. What I would do is I would put those on my paper. On this one, I'm going to have more blue up here. I'm going to fade it down. And then on the down here, I'm going to have more green. And I'm going to fade it up. So the green gets lighter as it goes up. The blue gets lighter as it goes down. And then I blend those together. Now, what I do is I let that drop. So step one is just pencil. Step two. Oh, Jack, could you please um, could you just a little? Ah, thank you. So step one is pencil. Step two is the water. Step three is let it dry. Step four, oops. <laughs> step four is, um, is dry pencil. And what I mean by that is, let's, let me help this dry out for just a second. Um, what I mean by that is that um, I want to, I can then come on top of this and I can add in some more pencil. And this I'm not going to be hitting with the water. This I'm going to just be letting it stay as colored pencil on top of that surface. <coughs> Excuse me. I'm going to take some green, pull that up here. So I'm just now using my colored pencils, just like colored pencils. But I'm doing it on top of something that is a blended and dried back surface. If I were to hit this with water again, I would get all sorts of unexpected weird things happening. Um, because again, those colors, they, when they're, they start to play with the, the colored pencil, I mean, they start to play with the water, they do a hue shift and a color shift, especially when there are different colors in combination. And the last thing that I would do is I would add any details on top of that. So for instance, is there a duck? It's looking a little bit more like a cormorant. So I'm going to give it a long body. Yeah, there's a cormorant swimming out there. So I draw my details on top of that. And that's not wanting to really take. A little bit of white gel pen. Let's 
So I draw my details on top of uh, whatever I have, and I'm done. The temptation, though, is so. So the the and then I'm going to put next step here is details. So if there are like any veins on the leaf that I had done, that's why I'd be putting those in at the end, just with pencil. And but let so I let the first coat of of the colored pencil and the water establish a background vivid color. I then can embellish that with some dry pencil and then add details in with the dry pencil. And then I can get these, these bright, saturated, vivid colors and any kind of color tweaking that I can get. You know, what you see is what you get with your colored pencils. And I'm not gonna be kind of going for one more surprise with the, with the, um, <clears throat> what, what, I'm not going to be surprised what that does when I hit this thing with 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 color. So then, let's go over to the Madison River. Um, and let's see here, looking in my email. And, oh, there it is, Madison River, photo number one. Oh, beautiful, beautiful. Oh, this will be really fun to play with. All right. Um, I'm gonna share this photo with everybody and we'll be able to look at this photo and also, Go. Hold on a second. So I'm now going to share a screen. And I'm going to actually hide my video panel, I'm going to hide the floating meeting controls. <clears throat> so Avea, are you seeing the Madison River on the left and on the right hand side? Um, the drawing, yes. The, the drawing paper, great. And we're good. All right. All right, let's, let's look at this drawing and how we would approach this with colored pencils. All right. So I'm going to start just by lightly, loosely blocking in um, what I, I have here. I have, I'm going to start with a little drawing and leave it open on the top um, so that when uh, at some point I'm going to kind of make a top here, but I'm going to put the top in when to sort of intentionally kind of play with composition. Um, there is a big diagonal of the river coming up and meeting another diagonal here. Um, there is a, there's a mass of trees in there. There's a mass of trees that are a little bit taller along the shore. Um, there is a distant hill that is going up and somewhere in here reaching its top and coming back down. There's a great big tree that is coming from the side over here and, and it's coming up here. And it's got another friend that is over there. I love that tree just kind of leaning out. I'm gonna get me some sunlight. I wonder if that was leaning out to get sunlight or if it tilted at one point because of an unstable bank and then just grew from there. The history of that tree is, it would be an interesting thing to explore. All right, now what I'm going to do is um, 
I am going to, um, I'm going to draw in um, part of what I'm seeing here. And as I do that, I'm going to first sharpen a pencil. I am going to actually not use one of those other pencils. I'm going to use my favorite. Um, this is one of my favorite pencils um, in my um, colored pencil kit. It is not water salt. But with some of these original lines, so I don't want to have to draw them twice, if I do it with a non-water soluble pencil, then it'll stay put. So here I have my black grape or raisin noir watercolor pencil. Or maybe not watercolor pencil, just regular colored pencil. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw in my picture with that. And so I can just start out here on the, the, the bank. There's a little, there's a tree that is sticking out here. And so I'm just making kind of a consistently inconsistent mark to sort of feel like my tree. And there's another tree that is uh, over here next to it. And so I've got little marks that are kind of more horizontal that are coming kind of out and kind of clumpy. And that makes it a little tree shape. They are out over the water. And there's a dark bank that comes down. This um, there is a larger tree that is down in this area here. And um, when you're drawing the tree, spend a little bit of time just at the top of the tree. If you get the area at the top of the tree, just to look a little bit more like the tree that you're drawing, everything below that can be pretty loose. But people will really focus on the details that you have at the top of the tree um, to understand what the branches below it look like. So um, then down below that, I could look at it now, but just kind of like that. Look, I'm drawing branches, look, branches on the tree. And it feels like a tree because of that. This look at this, they're really loose down here. A little bit wider too. And I'm just trying not to have it be too symmetrical. So the gaps and the spaces on either side are. Um, a little bit more tree ish top. And then down here, we have this is coming down for three, we have another tree coming up here. And I still want them to be the same size as I want it to. But there's also kind of there's bushes down here that are more lightly colored. Maybe that's interesting. So I'm going to leave some light stuff at the base of that. There's a rock out here. I'm not going to put a hard line around the, up the top edge of that. Um, it's got a nice little shadow over in this side. And Oh boy, there's this big tree. There's a big tree. Uh, there's another big tree back in here. Not yet, like the tree. I really love this black grape. Black grape, you can, um, it's, it's a lot more fun to draw your sketch with black grape because then uh, your, your drawing ends up. Um, well, it's just have this little bit of purpleness to it. I mean, it could be black, but ooh, no, it's black grape. And it just, uh, black grape, the little, uh, it, it, you're going to find that it really kind of plays nicely with a lot of other pencils. So, very often on a watercolor pencil sketch, I will start with, I'll start with black grape. And what I'm trying to do is just be consistently inconsistent as I'm coming down. Mm 
to be a little bit lighter uh, value on the right hand side of the tree. And on the left hand side of the tree, I can get into some darker shadows. So this, this chunk and then this clip that branches that hang out over the water. I wonder what caused that to influence tree decisions. My pencil tip has gotten really dull, so that allows me to kind of get just big masses of foliage really fast. My branches are kind of coming in here and putting a little bit of jiggle with my branch marks. Having having a black great pencil there in your sketching book, I think is a really good. That's a good thing. There's some distant trees off here. There's a, probably shadow of a cloud going across the landscape there. Um, have this distant forest to fill side. I'm going to put a little bit of vert vertical jiggle into my pencil stroke here. So I'm my pencil kind of wiggling up and down a little bit, making some kind of hint of vertical marks so it doesn't feel like, oh, there's some trees happening there. And then there are some distant ones. Yeah. There's some sky. So the reason I didn't put that lid on it is because I want to be able to figure out how much sky I want. I'm going to go for sky. Um, what about here? Now, I'm going to put some color on this. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to start with just some big zones of color um, with my uh, um, I'm going to see what it looks like. I'm going to get this nice dark color. I'm going to get some dark uh, I'm going to get some uh, some brown in there. Um, we'll do this brown instead. Of, yep. I'm going to get some other darks, maybe some dark purple. Um, I mean, there's not a huge color selection in these. Uh, polychromos pencils, um, but it's it's nice and dark. Okay, so I'm going to start with just sort of the, the coat. Uh, let's see, let's see what happens if I put all these colors together. You come together with you come together with you come together with you. Oh boy, let's see what we get. I get sort of the purplish gray. And that, if I push it towards, uh, oops, that was off the screen. Sorry about that. So it made a purplish gray mixture. And 
So I'm going to do that, but just maybe emphasize the blue a little bit more. I'm keeping these strokes horizontal. If any of those temple strokes show up in the final drawing, I want people to feel that this water is a horizontal surface. Um, and then I'm going to fade that blue towards the bottom. And then I'm going to come in with my green coming up into that. You can see the sparkle of the paper through. I'm not pushing so hard that I'm getting all of the teeth out of the paper. Let's put a little bit of purple into that. Maybe put some purple in here where we have these shadows of these trees coming out over the water. Um, Um, there's some watercolor, <laughs> watercolor. Um, and then we have um, put a little bit of kind of some golden into here, uh, a little bit of golden into this distant mountain side back here. Um, where's this supposed to be trees? I'm going to put some yellows into them. I'm going to put some like, greens into them. Um, in the foreground area, there are some, also some greens that you're seeing in here, and some oranges and yellows, and trees and bushes turning color in the fall. And you know, the bushes. So I'm just right now. I'm not really worrying about any detail on this. I'm just putting in kind of locations of uh, masses of color. Then there's the there's a sky back there that is just an intense, beautiful uh, blue, and I want that to pick up. And there are these really sharp edges of clouds against it. So um, let's see, what color is that sky going to be? Let's try a mix of what happens if I take that cobalt blue and makes it with a halo. Uh, those is that going to give me something with the color that I like? Uh, yeah, I think so. And it's going to be more cobalt towards the top. And I'm going to kind of work around the edge of this, this cloud here. And I'm going to work uh, around this cloud form in here. And I'm going to work around these clouds here. So I'm putting a little blue edge on my clouds.
and then I will Oh, I didn't do that all that with my competitor. I can just fail do that whole time. Mm -hmm. All right, so I'm going to take my mm -hmm. cobalt and work my cobalt more into the upper stack. You'll find that the sky at your zenith has a darker, more intense blue to it than the cyan that you find closer to the right. I've got some zones of color. And I know that all these still look really purple. We'll put some at the end, we're going to put some color into these trees with um I'm going to put some color into these trees with uh with dry pencil. So right now, now those uh those are the, the black grape is just doing a great job of kind of holding the place. All right, let's see what I can do. I'm gonna start from the bottom edge here. And work my way up because sometimes as I paint, I end up pushing a little wall of more intense paint forward. And if that happens, I want that intense wall of paint to be moving towards the top of the screen. See how that uh, black grape is holding its place? Having to kind of go back and forth a little bit to, to, to spread this paint around. This kind of down, bring a little bit of the blue off that edge, make that sky a little bit more. All right, there's some blue of the sky. There are purple mountain majesties that are back here. There is a more oakery hill back here. And we have the here and in this foreground here, be a mix of characters and those together. And finally, into the water here. I want to kind of get my brush stroke. The horizontal. Boy, that is quite a color shift, right? White rock and change the foreground.
if I now have a, a, a darker triangle there, I'm going to dry this off. It's not the, quite the right color. It's not quite the right texture. But think of this as like background colors that I will be putting other things on top of. Almost dry. Almost dry. Uh, dry. Right. See that a bunch of the colors sort of separated into these kind of lovely patterns, but they don't look anything like the water, but they are cool. Um, so I then have the decision of like, you know, do I leave this sort of marbling effect that I got in here? Um, or do I not? Also notice that the black breaks kept its position. It didn't blend with other things. It just stayed put. But I've got some more intense colors up in there. Great. All right. Now, I'm going to treat it just like a colored pencil drawing. And I can make, make perhaps some of these upper areas in the sky a little bit more like an intense blue. I'm not going to blend those out. Um, what about that distance hill over here with all the trees on it? It's really tempting to make, to kind of reach for a green for those distant hills, isn't it? But you look at it and it's, it's black. <laughs> we're really, we know it's green. If we're up there next to those, we'd be seeing green. But from out here, we're really not seeing green. So I'm going to avoid the temptation to drop in green on this. I'm going to put a combination of little brown vertical strokes like this. With some little brown vertical, little blue vertical strokes. It makes this sort of <clears throat> ambiguous dark mass that is up there. Um, there are down in here. Um, and so you can bring uh, a little bit of the kind of the jiggle of this pencil down into these trees here. And giving a hint of this. The ledge of probably cottonwoods back there. Cottonwoods maybe mixed with aspen. Um, back in here, Some brighter colors. Two places along the stream. There's some bushes. Not entirely satisfied with a bunch of the greens that I'm giving in this. A lot of them are too sort of bright, apple greens. 
Um, anytime you kind of have rings that are too kind of bright and apple-y, the, the, the antidote for that is um, some magenta. So here's pink tamarind. I'm going to mix that with some of those apple greens and it will mix those back to the screen a little bit more all of these. Any kind of green is too intense in the And uh, let's deal with some of the texture on this hillside. Um, I am going to get uh, this is a little bit of dark brown. And I am going to Some marks that sort of suggest the angle of the smoke coming down. And I'm going to put a little bit of roughness into this bank coming down. See how these marks are kind of coming down here, suggesting that this is a kind of cut bank here. And so some marks that are coming down this direction suggest that this is a bank. A slope on it, and this is a more flat hillside. Now, what about that river? I'll deal with the big area of forest in a minute. Um, all right, let's. I'm going to take blue here and I'm making horizontal marks, horizontal marks that. How people sort of interpret that as a flat head. As I get down here closer to the front, I'm going to make these little horizontal marks a little bit more bold and, and kind of. Bob, so you're actually sort of thinking that you're seeing little kind of individual ripples. See how that, putting that pencil over there, a lot of those sort of weird marks that were in there have now been obscured. Let's put some purple into the water. Magenta. Um, I'm going to do the same thing that's where I'm, I can reinforce some of these little ripple marks in this area where the shadows of the trees are. A little bit of that along the bank here coming out. I want that shadow on the far hillside to be a little bit stronger. Now I'm going to dive into this foresty area. Actually, let's put some green into this. Yeah. Yeah. Nothing is going to be right. Um, 
Now, I'm ready for those, those two. I want them to feel green, but I need to avoid the temptation to pour, or to, to like grab my green pencil and start going like, look, I'm a tree. Because it's going to feel really cartoony. I need something that is a darker value, right? Um, still feel a little green. I don't have a large, and that one's kind of a bluish green, but it's still, like all my green choices here are really pretty vibrant. So what I'm going to do is just, I'm going to have to use real restraint and mix my green, mix my green with some magenta. to get a more muted green. See how I did that? There's some green, there's some magenta on top of that. And then I'm gonna mix a little bit more green over the top of that. And it feels green, but it's a muted or olive green. So I'm gonna put some of that green down in here. And it's mixing with the black grape rather nicely. Just a suggestion that there's some green there. It will be more green on the right side of the tree because they are going to get more sunlight in those areas. We have a question from E. Uh, yeah. if it's in time. Um, she asks, in terms of paint, why do nature journalers or artists prefer watercolor over other media out in the field besides pencil or pen? Um, watercolor is great because I just have to, water is easy to bring with me. Um, so I like watercolor and gouache because they both require just water. If I'm using oil, then um, I need to bring turpentine or mineral spirits as a paint thinner with me. And if I'm doing acrylics, acrylics dry really fast and they also leave behind this plastic and sludge um, that I don't want to just be sloshing all over the landscape. And um, so the, uh, with, with the, with, with the watercolor, I can get, uh, it's, I can get these really kind of bright, bright colors, or I can get nice muted mixed colors. Um, they mix really nicely, and the, a lot of it is just a, the ease of the medium is because it is uh, the 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 medium is is a water base. So um, that's that for me. That's a that's a, a one reason why I really like. It. I'm putting just some straight green into this tree. And now I'm going to bring some greens into this one. As I, I'm doing this, I'm trying to think of the, the little kind of some clumps of this that are kind of catching, catching light. But the other places I let the black grape show through. Down in here, it is really in shadow. I'm gonna have just a little bit of green in there to say that you know these are green. Um, also, photographs will overemphasize the darks of things. So in, in photographs, that you said is if you're out there in front of it, you'll be able to see green in those parts of the trees. But it doesn't show up in your photograph, which washes those out. That so that green feels a little bit Christmas tree, a little bit cartoon. That's because it's just this kind of black green. And that, that's the color. Um, so that's where my friend magenta comes in. So magenta then climbs in on top of that. So let's move that down a little bit to 
So I'm putting that in in the sort of my, my pencil marks are a little bit sort of scattered and staggered and bumpy. So some places some of those little grains do show through, but other places they get covered up until you kind of get a sparkle. Magenta is great for making making greens. Just you simmer down over here. And there are a few places where there's some light green showing up in some of those branches. And the last thing I'm going to do is get some black grape again. Black grape, my little friend. So I'll go with my little friend. And I'm going to just kind of pull in just some of this, these uh, kind of the bank edges, the little darkness along the side of that. Yes. Some darks into my trees, parts where the trunk is visible. I don't want to have a big ah, look on the trunk line coming down, but a few little kind of trunk marks in there. Yeah, some places where you've seen that trunk. This is the, the part where there's the details that kind of go in on the top of everything else. Love the color of this black grape. This sort of seems to blend naturally with. You try to do this with black, and it just kills the drum. Um, lastly, I can put in uh, uh, just uh, there's a few little kind of bits of white foam down there in the water. And I might be able to do those with a gel pen. I'm going to try to do them with a little blade. So this is a, just a little knife. And I'm going to just do a test up here and see how well this is straight out. That straights out nicely. So um, what I am going to do is I'm going to sort of scrape along like this. And what it does is gives me this sort of, sort of stuttery mark that feels um, like it could be um, like it could be little wavelets down there. These little marks have to be horizontal. It's unforgiving once you, you put it in and you realize, I don't want this black grape. It's hard to go back. Maybe I'm going to have right up there on that point. 
Um, I'm kind of going back in from the other places I want to kind of punch in a little bit more detail, a little bit more darkness, a little bit more contrast. Really put. Once there's now here's a light green pencil in those, but once there's a lot of other stuff down there, you can't kind of get in there. Still put that in. And there's a little Madison River. Um, just looking back on the whole thing, uh, this zone back here is too bright. So I think I need to push that back in. Sometimes just at the end of a drawing, you kind of, if you've been up in little details of it, these things don't pop out to you as much. Um, one way of pushing that back in space is to add a little bit of blue gray to it. That cooler color visually pushes something into the background. So here I'm using what is this ultramarine light? Ultramarine light on that. And um, there's some some fun with colored pencils. Now, oh, maybe I'll just for fun. What happens if I put more purple in the light? So for me, when I play with watercolor pencils, um, I am aware that th they can do this, this color change and this value change. And so if it's going to do that, I would like to have it do that early on in the drawing. And, but I get sort of a nice sort of deep saturated color, right? So I can get all this intense blue in my sky. I can come back in later and kind of rework that. Um, but I, um, but it's gonna give me some nice saturated colors. The colors will change on me. 
So I don't want to blend all my colors, get them looking just white, right with my pencil, and then have it, have it really surprise me. So that's why I um, sort of step two in my drawing, draw up on your first coat of uh, colored pencils, and then hit it with the water, let that dry, let those changes happen early on, and then I can add. Then I can start just using the the watercolor pencils as regular pencils. Um, I can uh, come up with other. Oh, there's there's one other kind of fun thing that you can do. Um, let me just. <clears throat> I'm going to jump back to that screen. So let's say you know in here I did want some little globs of bright green shining through there. Sometimes what you can do is take your brush and wet your pencil tip. And kind of liquefy, oops. And kind of liquefy, liquefy that pencil tip a little bit. And then sometimes you're, you're able to Get a little, uh, you know, a light glob of, of of that 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 bright in there. Now I'm going to get this liquefied again. Have some little bright popping in back here. Maybe there's one over here. So you can get these sort of little globs of, of color popping in that way. Um, I should have stopped a long time ago, but <laughs> what can you do? Um, FaceTime camera. There we are. Hi there, everybody. Um, so that I hope give people a few ideas about messing with um, messing with the 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 watercolor pencils. Um, also, we did a painting where the water was really, 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 really dark. Uh, we still had some color coming into it. Um, the best thing to do on water is, is to believe the water, um, that sometimes it is crazy dark. Um, sometimes, you know, it's, it's the wine red sea. <laughs> um, and if that's the color that you're seeing, just believe it and go for it. Um, and uh, sometimes it is being, especially when it's very smooth, it makes a great reflector for what you're seeing up above you. So you can get real brights coming up into that. Um, but if all it takes is a little bit of wind and some chop and that reflective surface, um, it, it, it can be really, really dark. Um, let me first check in with Jan and see how that uh, if that was useful for your Madison River experience. Um, hey there. Thank you so much, first of all, for doing that. That was wonderful. And I, I'll be there again in about a week and a half. And it's making me antsy to go just to see you to see you do it with watercolor pencils. Um, yeah, and I think the multitude of colors you had in the water was really helpful. The um, purples in the along the bank because the banks there, you know, otters will go in and out of those banks and, and um, muskrats and, and it's really a, a muddy layer that sometimes is overgrown by plants, but it's dark right at the edges. So I need to do that more and, and not just, you know, bring this light green vegetation down to the edge. Um, the, as I put in the, the notes, that's a view from a bridge and it's um, on the Madison River and that tree that's leaning 
is right, that's an island in the river that that tree is coming out of. So you can see why it would have gotten undercut and it is right on the edge of that island. And the, the other side has a light flow, but that's the main channel that it's on, so. That's really cool. Yeah. Well, I would love to see what you do the next time you're up in big sky country. Yeah, it's pretty great. I'll be um, for a month at the Lamar Buffalo Ranch working there. So that's that's in Yellowstone. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Are you going to be sketching up a storm? Oh, we've we've got we've got bison envy. It's the best. Well, and and it's time for the red dogs. It's time for the babies. Yeah. The red dogs. <laughs> um, you, are you familiar with Buffalo Land? Um, no, other than the Lamar Valley. <laughs> okay, wait, hold on. Let me. Uh, I'm going to just take a moment. I'm going to go over to the bookshelf here. I'm going to come back with a book. Oh, good. That you probably can pick. Up. One of the few places you can find this. There's some visitor centers in and around Yellowstone that I've seen this book. Or you probably before you go, you can find it online. But. Oh, show me. <laughs> this this is gonna this is cool. Hold on just a second. Uh, Buffalo Land. Hey, it didn't take me long to find it. Um, so this is this is Buffalo Land by William oh, D. Berry. This is William Berry. Oh. Oh, oh. Yes. oh yes. Oh yes. <laughs> um and so it's written and illustrated by William D. Berry, my personal hero. Yeah. And um, let me, uh, I'm just going to make, uh, I'm gonna, I'll bring you back in just a second, yeah. but um, check this out. Uh, if you want some inspiration for buffalo sketching, um, it is all done with colored pencil. Mm. Um, and so he's got this, look, I mean, this, I love this little map. Um, and so this is uh, graphite with, a, with one color of colored pencil. Oh. Look at that incredible sky. <laughs> Talk about big sky, right? You can feel like the flat planes on the bottoms of these clouds. Here is this really spectacular sketch of a pronghorn speeding away. And then you run into oh. the birds of bison. Oh. Look at the texture on the back on the on the part of their cold coat that's still being rubbed off, you know. Yep. Oh. Yeah. Um, and so just the planes on these bison, I would suggest, you know, sketching some just what I, I've done is with this book is just copied a bunch of these bison line for line to try to get Bill Berry to teach me like, what are you doing here? How are you showing those changes in the planes and the angles? And he's got a limited number of colored pencils that he's, oh, look at those planes. Oh. oh. <laughs> so great. Isn't that cool? Wow. Love this, love it. Yeah. Um, these little cowbirds coming in here to, to mess with them. Now uh, he's he's gone ahead and shown their eyes, even though sometimes when you're looking at them, you really can't see their eyes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So just look at the 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 depth of this fur here. How he's shown that that is a mass that is sitting up on the top up. of the back. And. Now, another amazing thing about this that, it, that I, I find these, these drawings absolutely humbling, right? Oh. But here's the re um, even more amazing thing. Um, there was the, the, the publisher who he was working with had limited capacity and could not do color separation, but he wanted color pictures. So what he did is the green pencil on here, the blue pencil, the yellow pencil, each one of those was done as a separate layer, not all done in one drawing, but each of these separate colors was done on another 
um, on a separate piece of paper. And then the printer composited them to make the color drawing. Wow. Look, look at also, look at the texture of this grassland here. You really get the feeling that, so he's, he's shown you the texture of the grassland up here and the texture right at the base here in the middle here, leaving that out a little bit. Um, and then you kind of get the sense that there's, there's more of that back there. That's so wow. beautifully done. Oh. They are messing with telegraph poles. <laughs> um, but yeah, each, the, so the, the, the green, the blue, the yellow, the brown, the black, each one of those was a physically a separate separation that he did on different pieces of paper. Right. And then they composited them together to make these. That's, that's nuts, <laughs> right? Yeah. Um, I love those little bison right back there. Mm. So I suggest getting yourself a copy of Buffalo Land. I think that's a good suggestion. Um, before you, before you head out that way. this little inset map. A watercolorist um, that you probably know of named Molly Hashimoto is gonna be, uh, the, the Buffalo Ranch for people who don't know is an education center. It's in the park, it's run by the nonprofit partner of the park. And one of the classes that will be there is gonna be led by Molly um, when I'm there. So I'm, I'm I'm hoping that I get to be the bus driver for that class. <laughs> oh, fun. Are you going to be teaching uh, nature journaling while you're up there? Um, no, I'm, I'm going to be doing all support stuff. So oh. the, the instructors come in from, um, you know, I usually, I usually when I'm on duty, you know, just keeping track of what's going on at the ranch, I'll usually be doing some nature journaling. So I do talk with people about it, but um, yeah, there are uh, teachers that come in and they're teaching geology classes or zoology or you know fish or whatever um, while we're there. So it's a wonderful opportunity to learn. And those are classes that are available to anyone, Yellowstone Forever. You'd look up the Institute and see what classes are there. That's great. Uh, maybe put that, uh, a link to that in the chat. Yeah, I will. Um, and Avail, if we can, to, we can put that link in the um, in the, the the description when we post that. That would be really cool. Um, that's wonderful. Uh, you might yes. talk to them also about um, you offering them a nature journaling class. Well, there are some pretty great artists around there. I'm not sure I'm, I'm at that level, but um, but I'm happy to share the things that I know you know, with people there. So, so. Um, yeah. And, and again, nature journaling is not about, you know, so, so people who, there are people who can draw a pretty picture, <laughs> but can't do the same level of observation as the nature journal because they're not using the full toolkit. Um, and um, a lot of people are really intimidated from doing that because they think that the purpose is to draw a pretty picture. And um, so a nature journaling class that really kind of democratizes it and show that this is something that's accept, uh, accessible to everybody mm -hmm. um, as a way of interacting with nature um, is a really, really powerful thing. So okay. consider that. Okay, <laughs> I will. <laughs> I have a wonderful time. I look forward to seeing some of your, 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 uh, your adventures turn to paper up there. Yeah, thank you. It is, I, I love doing it. Excellent. Um, let me jump over to the gallery view and see if there's anybody else that would like to share um, something from their journals or thoughts, comments, and ideas. Um, let's join Kate and then Jack. Um, 
had you to the spotlight here. Kate, it's great to see you. Um, you can now unmute. Yeah, it's good to see you too. It's weird to have a week without uh, nature journal classes. <laughs> I'm sorry. They, I, I took a week oh, off. Oh, no, no, no. Because my, my daughters were out of break. school. My daughters were out of school and we just sort of made it a, a time for, for being with family. And that awesome. um, yeah, was fun. But I missed yeah. you guys a lot. Yeah, you were missed. Um, but I did get to spend a lot of time working on some of the stuff that we talked about in the last lesson, especially the drawing uh, frigate birds and such. Um, oh. <laughs> so it really works. I put in a lot of pencil miles. So I'm just going to skip through the about, highlight reel, I think. About how uh, many pages of, oh, look at this. Look at oh, here, this. Wait. I'll give you the chunk of. Yeah, the whole, whole just shows the, the thickness in that time. This is since I've last seen you, Jack. Ah! Oh, wow. That is yeah. really, those, those pencil, it's amazing to see how those pencil miles really makes the difference, don't they? It really does. I mean, I kind of, when you said that, you know, someone could learn how to draw birds fairly well in about a year if you really worked at it, that's kind of been my motivation to really put in the hours. Um, so I did that. Um, let's see. I've got a nice albatross here. Ooh, 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 ooh. And that far wing doing all the cool foreshortening. Look at how those yeah. primaries are just uh, foreshortened to a little dinky triangle out there. And I also love that um, eyebrow uh, extension on that waved albatross. Yeah, well, I have a friend who they do a lot of work with the albatross on Kauai. Mm -hmm. um, and so I figured, you know, I should learn how to draw their albatrosses. Um, let's see what else I have. Uh, we have a heron rookery by my house. Um, the oh, spotted look toads at the have depth been everywhere. In that nest. Yeah, well, you know where that came from. That's, this is really exciting. This is really fun. Yeah, uh, let's see what else do I have. Oh, I've got more cormorant or sort of water birds of various species. Oh, uh, yep. The, the texture on that uh, double crested on the bottom, on the texture on that bill, um, I've seen that. And that's challenge to represent. And then you compare that with the texture in the feathers, that little suggestion of those, those shadows there. And so you've got yeah. a double crested pelagic and a brants there. Yep. Um, I love that you just could tell exactly what they yeah. are. Yeah. Um, well, the, the, the pelagic, the one on the right, let's hold that back up. You know, it it has it's got much more of a snake neck look to it. So yeah, if like you've drawn if you've drawn a whole bunch of double crested cormorants, um, you'll draw the pelagic wrong because it will feel like it is too skinny in the neck. But um, this is this is just how you see them, and that little yeah. hint of iridescence, the purples going into gr blue greens there. Oh, this is, you're, you're, you're really just accepting the challenges that nature yeah. gives you and diving in. There's more albatross and frigate birds. Um, oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> uh, let's see. Oh, I've got a black crested night heron. Oh, sweet. And you're now kind of playing with different styles with a thick uh, ink line. Yeah. Yeah. But I figured I'd try and... Uh, learn how to draw some quadrupeds. So I started out trying to myself how to draw a bobcat when you can see the progression here. You know, I did the initial studies, I did some skull studies, and then they still look kind of funny. This actually took notes on your one of your videos. It was five things you can do to become a better artist. Um, <laughs> which, yeah. And I did your other video on uh, drawing weather phenomena. Mm -hmm which was pretty neat. Um, and then I went back to a video you did about different types of quadrupeds and how to draw their leg structures. Um, oh, this is, yeah. this is such so great sketches practice. Sketches of my cat who became less and less cooperative. And as that happened, they went from being nice pictures to uh, <laughs> a little bit more like, yeah! cartoonish. 
Rawr! Yeah, but then I kind of help with the bobcats and stuff. Um, let's see. And then towards the end, I started mixing up different types of cats and just trying to really get the shape and movement in there. Ooh, yeah, that, the, the bottom left, is that a, a, is that a caracal down there? Not a caracal, a uh, ocelot? I think it's an ocelot, yeah. 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 Um, there are some caracals uh, in there, though. Got more bobcats. Yeah. Oh, this is such, such, I mean, this is, folks, you're looking at just a great strategy for practice. Do this one, then do the next one, then do the next one, then do the next one. And so Kate's not worried about the masterpiece here. Kate's putting in a whole bunch of, uh, of, of, of pencil miles under the belt. And that's how these drawings get better and better and better. It's by making, you gotta put those marks down on paper. So watching a video yeah. doesn't do it. Well, hmm. But, but doing the, then the, the pencil miles and you, that's how your brain kind of wraps around this stuff. What I find is helpful is I'll watch a video on how to do something and then immediately after I'll practice it um, and try to implement it. Cause once like I've seen you do it, I've tried to do it while watching you do it. And then I go back and like go through the steps on my own. Um, here's some watercolor studies that I did uh, I was house sitting, they had a fish tank, but then I also turned on the webcams for the Monterey Bay Aquarium. They have a great one with spider crabs right now that's really fun to draw because you've got these, this dark background with the white like whale or dolphin skeleton in the foreground and the sand and they have these bright red crabs that move slowly enough and they're easy to draw. So I would check that out. That's cool. That's Monterey Bay Aquarium? Monterey Bay Aquarium. They've got some great webcams. Um, I met a carnivorous plant breeder at the farmer's market and I told him that he needed me to make botanical illustrations for stickers for him. So here's <sighs> the sketches for those. Yes, yes, what a great idea. Yeah. That's... And then the barn swallows are back at the barn. So I was working on doing mm -hmm. barn swallows in the field and then working on drawing horses but from drawing just like the leg position from looking at negative space and then i ended up watching a movie with my sister that was with a zebra that wanted to be a racehorse so i just sketched the whole way through with different horses and trying to <laughs> figure out um movement structure without pausing it to look at it um i noticed i kind of fell back on some old habits of drawing there so i really tried to fix that um so those were done without pausing it? Yeah, yeah. Whoa, you've got, you're, you're also really kind of getting a sense for the gates. That's really- Well, I know the gates impressive. really well because when you get to a certain level with riding, you want to know what the horse is doing with its feet at all times. So you're kind of like counting out what um, they're doing, especially between jumps. So regardless if you draw or not, you need to learn the gates. Um, <laughs> And that works for drawing all quadrupeds in one stage or another. So then this was just from last night. I got on Instagram, just scrolled down and drew everything that popped up in my feed that was uh, not someone else's artwork, but just like a photo. Mm -hmm. um, some bird studies. And I went back to the horses and thought, okay, I can really do horses well if I focus on those negative spaces. And that really created a more proportional look. Um, so that's kind of a nice way to practice. You a pigeon for Ray Bonto? Yes, I was, that's who I was thinking of when I drew that. So this is for you, Ray Bonto. <laughs> uh, let's see. And these were last bits from last Ooh. night. I, I um, like that, uh, that, the, that dropping those darks in on that uh, horse there really shows the volume with those. Yeah, well, what I was trying there. to do was with really sort of shiny, black brown horses you'll get the range from like brown to blue and so I use the same technique that you showed us for drawing um iridescence on birds to try and create that with a horse to show the layers of like the undercoat and horses that are outside a lot if they're a black horse sometimes they'll get this like reddish color as the pigment is destroyed um in areas that get a lot of sun so it creates this interesting red highlight hmm. yeah but it really helps with creating volume. And oh, that's, that's all I've got. That that's is, this is really inspiring. Catchers, 
Yeah, putting in a lot of pencil miles. <laughs> That's the trick. That's the trick. Yeah, it, it really is. Um, and so, you know, folks, we, we're, we're not in competition with each other. We are here to mutually inspire and encourage each other. So sometimes when you see somebody else who's like made like, you know, a, a whole bunch of, of, of pencil miles, sometimes what you'll, you'll, you'll say to yourself like, like, oh, there's no way I could do that. And so you feel kind of deflated from it. But what, what, when that happens, what I want you to realize is that's just a little bit of the voice of a fixed mindset in you. We all have a little bit of that fixed mindset. And so what you want to do is retrain that to kind of to instead of like, oh, that's just, oh, I couldn't do that to like, ooh, that's inspiring. I can do that. Right. And that this is this is this is what our little wad of electric meat is capable of when we keep tasking it and holding it up to the challenge. And uh, we can do this with any any skill. And um, uh, that was that was really inspiring. Thank you so much for that for sharing that. Yeah, thanks for having me. Absolutely. Also, only other thing to say about that is if you can get to the point where you feel comfortable in that discomfort area, where you're not working on something that you're familiar with, but like that's why I did the bobcat. So I was like, I know that if I just tried to draw a bobcat, I don't know how they work. I know it looked pretty funky, and so finding that like growth area because that'll come back and help you in anything else that you're going to do yeah that's right so kate is deliberately looking for areas outside of her comfort zone yeah right um and all the actually there's research on neuroplasticity that look she's drawing right now right now right now yeah. the um so <laughs> the, uh, I put stuff on the back of envelopes when i send people letters so Oh. I figured I'd send my friends some oyster catchers. Your friends need oyster catchers. Um, of course, you know. But um, the, the, the research on neuroplasticity shows that when we, um, the, the sweet spot to surf is just outside of your area of comfort. So you want to surf the wave that's just a little bit larger than the one that you feel comfortable with. And that's where you're going to learn. Much bigger than that, you're going to get crushed by the wave and freak out and not want to go out on the water again. But just you push yourself a little bit outside of that into that, right? And there's 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 a there's a risk there. There's a vulnerability. And you have to be open to that vulnerability instead of playfully or or or, or safely playing in the, the zone where I know I can do it. That's kind of with drawing people because that's the really big wave. And I'll go and I'll work on that because it's kind of flying blind into an area I'm not familiar with. And it'll beat you down so hard that like, I need to take big breaks between like working on drawing people because it's so kind of discouraging. Mm -hmm. um, so but, so then, yeah. you, then you have to put them on a horse. Yeah, yeah. That usually makes it worse, but for some reason I pulled oh. it off last night. So, and that was all about drawing that outside edge, which I have used with some success before with drawing like, uh, pictures from historical reenactments. I use the same techniques for capturing like bird silhouettes for um, for like Revolutionary War soldiers, which was pretty funny, but it works remarkably well. So yeah. That's fun. Okay, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Let's join Jack. I see Ray Bonto, Susan, and Avea also have things to share. Um, uh, Jack, it's great to see you. Oh, wait, hold on a second. Now you can unmute. Uh, wait, hold on, let me try again. Um, now try one more time. There we go. Excellent. Sorry about that. Um, so a couple of weeks ago, I was geeking out with plant yoga, and I did lots of stuff on that. Uh, oh, oh let me let me. I'm gonna minimize my screen so that we can uh, so that your plant yoga is. These two rhododendron leaves. This one is alive. I pulled off a tree, and then this one I found on the ground, all shriveled up. Oh, and I, I love I that little see. highlight along that edge. Just turns it up into uh, into the light, just just enough so you can see what's on top of what. That's and I cool. did some more here. 
um i found this blade of grass i think it was like onion grass or something that had like curved up into like a little um oh. like circle and then this was an, another leaf that was doing plant yoga and this one looked like a taco shell <laughs> mm, tacos and and then i was geeking out with the boobies and albatrosses oh. Nice. nice. That was a little stretched out. Another albatross. Oh, this is great. This is really cool. Another booby. Aren't aren't those beaks fun? Yeah. And those beaks are so I cool. I went hiking last Saturday. No, two Saturdays ago. And in the woods we found this huge tree that had fallen on this smaller like stumpy tree and just splintered it to pieces it was really cool whoa oh that's crazy and i found this thing oh it's that's crazy. that's neat little fiddlehead and it just got such cool fuzzy on it and so you mm -hmm. taped that in to the yeah. journal there um that's neat and i see you're you're you've got um, you're you're counting. You're using words. You're using pictures to describe what you see. You're getting your metadata in there. You're asking questions. Doing it reminds me of this is like the full brain workout. Um, and, that's really cool. Yeah, and um, this one, this one's really cool. Um, I picked a bleeding heart flower off of um, from our garden. Um, and I had lots of observations on that one. Oh. Um, it looks like there's nothing there, but um, I, for Easter, I got this really cool um, pen that's filled with invisible ink. So I did all my observations. <laughs> oh, oh. The glare, it's a glare, there's a glare. Yep, this is so Da Vinci Code. Uh, that's really, really neat. Yeah, and, and I had a little hooded mug answer. Uh, did that show up in one of your local ponds? No, th uh, this was from a book during when my mom was reading to us. That's and, right. Um, yeah, two days in a row this happened. So I got up early and I was outside um, journaling up in our tree house in the, the crow's nest up high. And I, so like I'm sitting, I'm sitting with my back to the crow's nest. So like the top of the roof of the playset is right here. Yeah. A little, li little farther up than that. And I'm just journaling and I hear this scratching of wood and I look up and there's a mockingbird right in front of me. Like I could have stood up and petted it. Whoa. Pet, pet it. Yeah, it was so cool. And that happened two days in a row. It was awesome. He, only, he was only there for like five seconds, but his eyes were like golden brown and you could see every detail about him. And the second time I was like, hey, buddy. And he just looked at me and then flew away. Wow. Wow. That is, you know, uh, uh, it, it's, it's neat. Sometimes like you, you spend all this time trying to get close to nature, but if you hold still, it will come to you. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's really fun. And I've had a lot of um, bird firsts too lately. For the first time in my life, I saw a brown thrasher a couple of days ago hopping around our yard. Aren't and, those bills crazy? Yeah, um, they've got long tails too. And for the first time in my life, a couple weeks ago at the golf course by a pond, I saw a killdeer. And yesterday when we were golfing by that same pond, I saw two canvasbacks. Oh, that's that's great. You know, you're you've really got your eyes open for all those birds around you. And, um, you know, you're just you're going to be making more and more and more discoveries. Jack, that is so exciting. Um, and your approach to journaling, the way you're using, I notice, I wonder, it reminds me of words, pictures and numbers, integrating those all together on the page. That is that is that's exactly how we train our brains as as a naturalist. Um, that's fantastic. That's fantastic. I'm really, really proud of you and the work that you're doing. Thank you. Could, could we see that page with the um, black light one more time? 
<laughs> That's such a cool idea. I had to cover this up because I wrote use a black light to see the observations. Ah. Uh, look at this. Oh, that's really neat. <laughs> Bravo. Really well done, my friend. Thank you so much for sharing that. Thank you. Um, let's bounce over across the pond to our friend Ray Bonto. Um, and Arpan, good to see you too. Um, you can now unmute. Hi there. Hi. Um, as usual, I went a little ahead. <laughs> I would expect nothing less from you. That's great. I, I like the texture you're getting in the trees there. I like that sort of you get the feeling of those those the the horizontal masses of branches in a conifer. Yeah. Um, as for my nature journaling, we took some trips during the whole Easter season um, to various places, and my usual book is the tone paper, but that is a struggle to take <laughs> because it's big and it only just fits in the bag, <laughs> so mm -hmm. I have to take this. Yeah. Um, um, but, let's see. First one, uh, we went to somewhere called Teddington and saw this great crested grebe for the first time. Mm. For well, the first time I can remember. <clears throat> oh, that's really fun. Yeah, just like Jack is spotting uh, new species around them, um, it's it's really cool. When you go someplace new like that, there'll be all these different, all these different little beasties that you're. Um, that, that pop up and play with you. That's really cool. Thank you. And on the way back, it was so surprising. Um, we saw a swan nest. Um, well, we had seen that for a few days, but the swan had wandered away instead of sitting inside it. Um, and I saw an egg inside. Oh, oh, really? Inside the, yep. Oh, there's several eggs. Yeah, um, when the swan came back to sit on it, it started shuffling the, around and I realized how well they, they were camouflaged. Wow. Oh, this is really cool. And then on the river, there was some, there was a fish. Oh, it's being coy with you. Um, oh, and you've got good me uh, good measurements in there as well. So you're counting things. This is, oh, wait, is that yes, two and a you... half feet long? Yes. Wait a minute. Are you using the imperial system? <laughs> Sometimes. <laughs> Sometimes, ah, uh, uh, we gotta get you, we gotta get you some decimeters. <laughs> Uh, yeah. The, um, so I, I would say, don't don't make a habit of the imperial system. I'm really delighted that you're taking measurements, um, <laughs> but uh, the uh, the uh, this is really cool. I also like the the three quarter view looking down on this thing. That was the only way we could see it. Yeah, um, just draw what you see. And is that life size egg? Yes. Approximate size of the egg. That's really cool. That's cool. I also like that, just that little hint of a shadow on the underside of it. Um, really kind of gives us just a sense of its volume really fast on the on the underside of the egg there. Yeah, this was sketched from a low bridge. And we looked on the other side. Um, 
and we saw a Canada goose nest. Oh, interesting. That had like six or seven eggs. Oh, wow. It, it was shocking. Oh, and there it is turning its eggs. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's a life size. Much yeah, they more. have to keep rolling those eggs around. Otherwise, they don't, they don't hatch. That's cool. Oh, yeah. so it's, um, and and so the, the Canada goose has more of a cream colored egg. Yeah. Oh, that's interesting. And I wonder why, I wonder why, do you, do you think of the, the goose and the swan sort of similar habitat? I wonder why the difference in the color. Oh, this is the, the, the swan that, um, is this the, was it a mute swan that laid the eggs there? No, not the same one. All yes, it's right. a mute swan. All right, that's, that's a cool structure on its bill. Nice negative shape under its head too. Yeah. The oh, and there's the grebe. A grebe nest. Oh, whoa. But it was sitting, I, so we couldn't see any eggs. Yeah, they make a floating nest, don't they? Yeah. That's cool. That's really interesting. Ooh, I have grebe envy. This is a neat species. Yeah, quite. And some. Is this the Egyptian? Yeah, the next day after the day after that, we went to Richmond Park and like 500 meters away from the water, there was an Egyptian goose in the grass. Mm hmm. Nice, um, nice proportion and shapes on the bill. And oh, what surprised me was that they ate grass. Mm -hmm. I've seen and Grant and Canada Goose out on lawns just going nom 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 eating grasses. Yeah, I saw Canada Goose doing that too. Mm -hmm. um, and, Um, there's some birds over there. Yep, just any angle that you see. We saw a mandarin. <gasps> um, oh, that's cool. Look at this three quarter view down on it. Um, nice construction lines kind of getting, you know, some people, they would see all these lines and patterns on the goose and just give up without even starting. A great job diving in. And I also really like this, this three quarter view looking down on it. As for now, they're having some problem with the mallard geese. Um, well, once the mallard jumped into the water and the mallard just walked over it. <laughs> <laughs> And started pecking it. Uh, um, really? It, yeah. it, it was it was pecking the mandarin. Yes. And oh then, man. Uh, the mandarin wanted to be left alone, so it picked out two mallards that were going, just roaming around, and it pinched one of them, uh, and the other mallard <laughs> bit the mallard who had been bitten like shame on you <laughs> um... <laughs> that is really funny um but then but then the mandarin uh, bit both of them <laughs> oh, um, wow. and chased them away and the egyptian geese um there were two of them and they kept on chasing each other um like that's their defense posture and then they're running um so they're kind of skittering across the water or are they charging on land on land mm -hmm. um and the other geese's response was to stand up as straight as he could and flap and make a screech wow 
that's really interesting. So one is doing head down and the other one in response does a really a tall posture head up. Yeah, one is charging and the other is just still. Now, one of their um, a, a really powerful defense mechanisms they have is they will can use the their carpal bones, their wrist bones to bang um, opponents and, and things. So sometimes they'll, if they're kind of flapping the wings, if they hit you with that little wrist. Um, it's their little bird boxing glove. Yeah. Now this is a... Ooh. <laughs> Madu. Yeah. I mean, you can't make something like this up. This is such a cool, crazy looking bird. You know, I have seen one of these once in a zoo. Um, wow, that is such a fun bird. Nice job pushing the value range with your watercolor. Quite fun. Yeah, and folks, notice the- What the, you're doing is display thing. Yeah. And folks, notice the, the position of the legs on this. Notice that the standing position, the bird is fairly horizontal, um, the sort of the oval of the body. And then hold, hold it a little bit higher and notice, notice where the legs come out on that body. So this is what is the, the this arrangement is typical of the dabbling ducks. So the dabbling ducks are the ones that can kind of go around in the water and they'll tip up. So their little tail will go up in the air when they're kind of getting things underneath them. Um, and they'll put their head down deeper in the water and their little feet will paddle around. They, um, they have legs that kind of come out in the middle as opposed to diving ducks. And the diving ducks, um, like a, a scop, um, will have their, their, their legs attached way at the back of the body. So when they sit, their body is at a much more vertical angle. Um, so in the posture of this bird, uh, Ray Bonto has really accurately recorded really a bunch of the, the structure that relates to the natural history of this duck. Um, you can actually predict what sort of feeding behavior will have based on where those legs come out. And then that gives you uh, a, a, a sense of um, whether it's gonna be dabbling or diving. And that also changes the posture when they're up out of the water. This is a really cool drawing. Yeah, I didn't get to sketch it, but there were some pink footed geese over there and one of them w w w went very close to me, and it was clear it wanted to get my sketchbook like the geese did last year. <laughs> wow! Um, so I kept. <laughs> that is, that is crazy. So, um, th this this it, it was coming to try to peck at your sketchbook. Yes. Um, could, can you hold that up so that we could see the, the, the drawings a little bit? That's, an, that's another day. Um, some baby Egyptian geese. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, folks were asking about how to draw goslings. Oh, this is, this is really cool. I, I love your 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 the the loose pencil combined with the watercolor wash just like john busby um really a, a great effect there that's that's fun and that little green um splotch on the side a little bit of a hint of the speculum that's cool thank you so much for sharing that oh oh and then we're back with our pigeon friends. Oh, look at 
Look at this, folks. There's just so many sketches on that one page. Zooming in, zooming out, getting profiles, getting postures, getting facial details. Um, you're really paying attention to these. Wow. Love the way you mix watercolor. How what does those those vibrant colors in the foreground, paler in the back, really that's something that visually gives us a sense of depth on this. Folks also notice the petal on the far left hand side, how that is foreshortened because it's just sort of edge on towards you. Um, in order to get things details like that in your sketch, you really have to believe the bird in or believe the the flower in front of you and just pay attention to the shape of what is that petal doing right now from this angle a great way to see that is to close one eye when you're looking at the flower because then you don't have the problem of looking at that flower from two slightly different angles through your two different eyes very cool very cool love the angles on this yeah. oh, ray bonto that's great our pen have you been doing some sketching as well yeah, a little bit. Yeah. So these are some casual designs I was working on. So um, just to make a sketchbook for myself. So oh, that was with the brush. That's paint. really lovely. Um, so and also I love the way that two of them overlap. Just visually, it makes that page much more interesting. So if you are doing a bunch of little landscape ethos sketches in a place and you overlap a couple of them, some things are overlapping, some things are not, that visually will make the arrangement on the page much more interesting. That's cool. Oh, yes. I, I like I like the, oh, wait, hold on a second. There we go, okay, good. Uh, this, this was done with a brush pen. <clears throat> that texture on the bark is really cool. Yeah, it was with the brush pen. And this was uh, Richmond Park also, again, just we were sitting in front of a lake when Ribonto was about with the ducks, always. Um, in, in front of the lake. And I've been now, now to... um, just go, we'll go back to that other one for just a moment. Um, so something that Ray, uh, that Arpan had to do here to successfully make this drawing is that tree in the foreground left. Don't take that tree for granted. Look at what's going on on that little one. All right. So it is a pale tree against a darker background. So in order to get that, you had to sort of figure out where it goes in advance, paint around it to get that dark. And then there's a little bit of a blush of shadow in the bottom. And then notice how two things, one, that dark shadow just adjacent to the bottom foliage really pops that out. And also the little bit of shadow on the ground roots that into the ground. So several um, strategies going on here that you can apply to the trees that you draw. So the pale tree against a darker background, figure out the outline of that tree, paint in the stuff around it, and that's what's going to make it pop. You can't add that tree in later. And then notice that little bit of shadow on the bottom of the tree, the darker shadow uh, right below the foliage, and then a little bit of horizontal dark shadow on the ground, and that places the tree on the ground. That's that's really cool. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm doing some uh, tree study just to vaguely understand if I want to how the tree would look. So these are very quick brush pen sketches. Mm -hmm. Just to overall. Um, then I do a, another tree with the brush pen. This was, oh, I don't wow. know what tree it is. Could be a. I, I love those, yeah, those branches brush. that are where this is the light part of the foliage going across the major trunk of the tree. That's cool. That's really cool. That uh, tree has a lot of depth to it. And that's with a brush pen. I really haven't used, utilized these very much. That's really exciting. I also it's like the sort of pale. And very hand, 
it's not very easy to use them because you can't really blend the colors and they dry quickly depends on pen probably i, I use a very cheap one but it, the, the light <clears> blue that i'm seeing the light regular. blue wash that's back there is that hitting the brush yeah. pen with a little bit of water no i did the i was carrying this uh pencil brush anyways so i just put a dab of the brush pen and quickly do a got wash. it so I it like takes it. away that deeper color yeah and uh, i came in late today so i didn't finish it but i did it in watercolor ah uh, oh i really like the way that distant mountain has worked out yep It'd be so easy to paint those distant trees a really bright green, and then that would kill it. But you really get the sense that those are really distant trees back there. And I also like the texture on your treetops. That's fun. Thank you. That's it, Jack. Um, folks, notice how Arpan is testing the watercolor colors out on the side of the paper before they hit down on the on the on the paper that's a really good strategy so you're not surprised like oh i didn't think it would be that color right that's a very good strategy to go from you know get the paint on your brush see what it looks like on paper how watery is it how intense the color is before you touch down great strategy thank you thank you thank you great thank you. Good to see you really good to see you too Arpa. um let's join thank susan um i'm going to hey there susan um i'm going to bring me in here and we are going to now you can unmute hi can you read yes hear you loud and clear okay. great it's a really great class thank you i i uh yeah i uh got some watercolor pencils like a year or so ago and i just sort of like not really tried them very much. This is really good inspiration to try them out and get to know them because they definitely do behave kind of weirdly. So it'd be really fun to yes. experiment. Yeah, and, yeah. and the thing that puts a lot of people off is that when they, they finish a pencil drawing and then they hit it with the watercolor and then you'll just kind of go like, I just destroyed this pencil drawing that I did. Um, so yeah, you see it as a stage in that process. Oh, fun. So this actually this interesting thing is, so I got these, um, these these ones here, I found them on clearance for like really cheap, which they're very expensive. So it was like super lucky. But um, and uh, the interesting thing I noticed is that I hit them with water, and they do activate, but they really they they keep the pencil texture. And I think with a lot of scrubbing, I could get rid of the pencil texture, but it would uh, it kind of made the watercolor look not, not so good. So. Um, I, I think it's, I, I'll have to experiment with it and see if different papers make a difference, but um, I kind of like it with the pencil texture. Yeah, and, yeah. I would, I, so I I would say that's a, that's a feature rather than a bug. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I just, it, it's interesting to get to know the features of your particular tools, because if I got to know these ones and then tried the, the ones that you have, I might be very surprised by the difference in behavior. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean, that, that was a lot of fun, but I wanna show you. So they had asked at the beginning um, people to share what they had done for um, uh, Earth Day, if anything. And um, I volunteered, uh, from the, the Albany Pine Bush Preserve had a big volunteer thing to do um, garbage cleanup and also tree planting and a bunch of other things they need. There's a lot of roads that run around and through the preserve that have a lot of garbage on them and people just throw stuff out of the car, it's terrible. So I signed up for that. And um, also speaking of things that we are, oh are outside our comfort zone. I am very, very, very uncomfortable with drawing people and I don't like to do people. And I'm mm -hmm. trying to force myself to do it because um, I also thanks to they have to feel, feel like it's, it's good to like put ourselves in our, in our journal sometimes. And so I've been trying to do that and not be too nervous. And I did have a photo to work from. So, and I also sort of said like, well, if I make it really cartoony, then, you know, I won't have to worry about it. So that was fun. Yeah. And then also taking more inspiration from Avea to show like, what's the actual garbage that we found of which this is a selection of things that we, we found. Um, and yeah, it was really, really a lot of gross stuff in there. So I'm really glad we got rid of it. And there were um, a bunch of teams in different areas working on that. So that was good. Oh, that's and, really cool. And as a bonus, Oh, by the way, also, by the way, well, well Ned, you know, here's my attempt at doing a bird that I saw for two seconds through the binoculars and mm -hmm. tried to 
I implement all the things I've been learning in these bird drawing classes we've been doing. So uh, it's, it's uh, right. It's very, very kind of it's very goldfinchy. Wow. Well, the thing is, I, I I can't say that I would have recognized a goldfinch if it didn't have breeding because I definitely would recognize it if it had the bright yellow. But what it actually what I saw it was not bright yellow at all, and I'm not at all sure that I got the colors right. And I think it may have been a ruby crowned kingler. Oh, yep, that also which has it, those really bold wing bars. Yeah, and which and was also um, a little bit later on that same trail. I I actually did see one up close, and it and it like flipped the little ruby crown up. So I was like, oh, yep. Okay, it's tiny and has a ruby crown. It's a woodpecker, so it's got to be that. Um, was so. your bird very hyperactive in a tree? Yes, there was a big old tree, um, big old vine going up the tree, and the bird was like, boop, 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 up down yeah, the vine. Yeah, that sounds you know, very and, kinglet. That sounds yeah, okay, very. Well, they cannot was, sit still. Yeah, it's. I was through binoculars, and it's really hard to judge the size I'm finding through binoculars. So I, yes. I think I would convince myself that it was bigger than that. So I, I wasn't, but I mean, yeah, so this, but you're the third person to independently suggest that, that kinglet sounds like a good possibility. So I'm gonna, uh, which I did actually sort of, I noted later that I had seen a kinglet and that, um, that it looked similar to that. So uh, I don't know. That's cool. Yeah. That's okay. fun. So, That's really fun. <laughs> Here's the thing. So while I was doing the garbage cleanup, right, got a tip off. Got a tip off about following. Page here all about this nice tree that has Ooh, oh my colors. goodness so apparently well not apparently there is there was a nest of great horn owls that's right near the trail on this one um one part of the preserve oh. and there's two chicks and they've been hanging out in there so the thing is, is okay, so the reason that people were talking about it, the woman who works at the Pine Bush was explaining that there had been some days where there'd been like 10 people out there with cameras, all standing around making the birds very nervous. And some people were like hooting at them and stuff and trying to get them to come out. And then, so she basically, so I said like, should I just not even go over there? And she says, well, like if there's, if there's just like one or two people for a short time, it's probably okay. So I went and I go, I went, went to go see and I said, okay, if there's a crowd, I'll just leave because- yeah. And it, it's fun to see birds, but I'm not going to, but it turns out I got, got to where I was looking around for where she said they were. And I saw one person watching. So I sort of quietly sidled up and sort of looked in the direction that person was looking. And then they were there and they seemed to be perfectly content. Uh, so yeah, so I got, and actually, so I got to stand there and there weren't too many, there was only that one guy and he then left. So um, yeah, so I got to watch these, these two great horn owls. I think the parents couldn't oh. see them. I don't know where they were. But the two chicks are really big. I mean, I um, and they've got like real feathers. So I think they like and they were up on a branch. Yep. They weren't the nest is down here. And the two chicks were hanging out. They never left the branches that they were on, but they moved back and forth on the branches. And they're just looking around at everything. They were looking at me. They were looking. There were a bunch of kids rode by on bikes on the trail down below, and yeah. they turned their heads looking at them. So yeah, so I just really got to like watch through some binoculars and. And uh, and see what they're doing, trying to get the posture, um, big fluffy feet. Yeah, it is very. It was really interesting because you know a lot of other birds, obviously, of course, have very naked feet. But these, when 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 this one like pulled sort of lifted its foot up to to try and preen, I swear it was like a cat's paw. Yeah, just it super paw, fluffy. It was just a paw. Yeah. Yeah. So, <laughs> and the little nubbins there, they get little, just when the wind blew, the little the little. Little, little nuggets of, 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 up, of up, feather up. for the, the for the big air quotes horns and yeah, yeah. something that's, that's neat about these is that with that little fluffy foot mm -hmm. um they sometimes will hold three fo toes forward more typically they hold two toes forward so they didn't get the memo that all the owls are supposed to have two toes forward but but sometimes you know, you'll see a regular perching bird perching with two toes forward and two toes back, even though it's supposed mm -hmm. to have three toes forward. And sometimes you'll see an owl and it'll be sitting there with three toes forward and one toe I, back, I even it's though it's supposed like, to do it the other way. It's like, I could hold a pencil like this, but I could also hold it like this. And sometimes I prefer yes, that. Yes, that's right. That's cool. And, and so they, well, they pay attention will, to that. The, yeah, the, 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 the rule of thumb is that they can do whatever they want to do with their foot. <laughs> yeah, I was, telling, I was talking to some people that you're saying like, yeah, the birds don't read the field guides. 
That's right. That's right. <laughs> you know, so I, I mean, feel like I keep saying, oh, nuthatches, they go down the tree. Well, no, I've been watching them and they go up the tree too. So <laughs> yeah. Yeah. They, they always go down the tree except when they don't. Right. So there's a little few more, few more drawings. Um, oh, and look at these little angles on the faces. Yeah. Was, oh, I love how you handled like this. 20 loud kids on bikes road bike. It's right by the trail. And so the owl, this one owl, the one owl on the, on the, on the left was just like, he never moved. Well, I say he, but he just, his head went, you know, the full 360 just about. That's um, cool. That. Yeah. So that was really fun. Hopefully I'll go back and see them some more. Um, but uh, yeah, and, and also some turkey vultures, so, you know, were flying overhead. So I was trying, trying to get the silhouette because I really like turkey vultures, but they're, and they have a very distinctive silhouette and I'm not really sure that I got it, but um, mm -hmm. let's see. But uh, yes, yeah, so that was, that was. Oh. Uh, and and I, I love, again, that, that how you're showing like all these little variations in the head position and then that big fold tilt the other way. And you're just showing that there is this, um, uh, uh, you know, a little indication of where the wing was relative to that. Um, you didn't yeah, have to redraw the the, the whole bird <laughs> each time. Let's let's actually just see that page one more time. Let me I'll minimize my page. Just look at this. Imagine yourself in front of the owl. It's moving its head around, and you're following. You don't you not have to draw the owl again and again and again, or wait for it to come back to the that other position. But if you get just this little hint of of what are the angles on that facial disc from this angle? What about that angle? Oh, now it's a little bit different. Draw that too. So many people would try to draw one view, one angle instead of flowing with the bird. So very good, except you just got to accept what the owl gives you and move on and then accept what the owl gives you and move on. That's great. Well, I've been really enjoying these 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 bird drawing classes on on Mondays too. And but the, the trouble is, I still have the, I still have the issue that I I take good notes and I learn all these things about field drawing and all these things, and then I see a cool bird and I just panic and just lose my mind and then just revert to whatever I happen to be doing. So more practice, I think, including more practice, just drawing critters when you know when they're out there doing their thing. Um, I find it a lot easier to draw plants out in the wild because they will usually hold still for you. <laughs> So yeah. yeah, but I'm having and, a lot of fun with that. And, and, uh, and, and if you find that like you take a class and then later on it's hard to apply it, um, I really recommend the Ebbinghaus approach to reviewing notes. So um, Ebbinghaus was this researcher who looked at memory and how much we hold in memory and found that when we learn something, the amount of information in our brain very, very quickly degrades and decays. And um, I mean, within minutes of having learned something, right? And so what Ebbinghaus did is sort of came up with a strategy for timed reviews of things. So for instance, um, uh, you, you heard Kate saying, um, uh, earlier that, okay, I'm gonna watch the video and I'm drawing it while that's going on. And then the video ends and now I'm gonna draw it again all on my own, right? What that is, is in the moment, you're following along learning something. Then within 10 minutes, you're repeating that. And so what you're doing is you're kind of, you learn something and the decay begins and then by reviewing it, and again, you're gonna pop it back up again, and then it starts to decay again, but this time at not as steep a curve. And then if at the end of the day, you review that one more time, you pop it back up and then, and then it's gonna begin decaying again, but at an even slower rate. And at the end of the week, so you do it one more review, whatever it is that you learned is going to be really fundamentally yours. So. You're gonna do one um, review right after you finish learning something. Then another um, review within an hour, one review at the end of the day, and one more review at the end of the week. For anything that you're learning, this is much more effective than learn something, don't engage with it, and then cram before the test. So it's my, this. My students tell me proudly how they pulled an all-nighter for the test, and I just no. 
No, yeah, all the oh. research is that that doesn't work. Yeah. Um, I'm going to take notes and I'm going to go back and review those notes that ebbing. Um, let, me, um, let me just sort of bring up a visual here. Um, and I have now got myself a little Google search here. And um, the um, that's not what I want. This is what I want. Um, hold on just one second. This, this, this Ebbinghaus um, approach to learning and studying is it's evidence-based, incredibly powerful. And, and some teachers actually build this into their lessons. They'll do this, all right, now it's time to review it. And then you actually, in later or in the day, then you come back and you review the same thing. And so you can actually build that into the structure of a class. Um, and um, let's see. So I'm now going to share the screen this one here. And yeah, here's these Ebbinghaus curves. Hey, there's, there's Ebbinghaus. Hi, hi, Ebbinghaus. Um, and what it does, um, yeah, I'll, I'll just sort of pick up one of these. So if you learn something, um, let's say a hundred percent is uh, sort of right, sort of at the time that you've learned something um, that that we'll call that one hundred percent of learning whatever you're going to learn, and then that starts to decay, and then if you stop and you review that information, um, the first time you do that, notice that this decay rate is now not as steep a line as it was. And the more that you do that, then what you're doing is you're, you're changing the, the angle of the decay rate of this information. And so, um, you know, even with two repetitions here, look at how much more information your brain is storing. And then with um, a fourth repetition, you know, it just gets better and better. So um, this, Here's one way of kind of looking at it. Um, so here is, uh, you've learned something and it is quickly tapering off to nothingness, right? Then what you do is within 18 minutes here, Ebbinghaus is repeating it. You're pumping yourself back up here. And now if you did nothing else, you're going to, that information is gonna decay at a different rate and flatten out at about 60% of the information held rather than about 25%. If you do a, um, a second repetition um, within, by the end of the day, you're bounced up to here. Look at that. And then here's at the end of a week, you now have you're you're flatting you're 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 flatlining now out at about ninety percent repetition. So what it is, it's this. You're just going to review the information. You're going to review it again, but you're doing it at specific, deliberate, timed intervals, and that's what makes the difference. Um, what most people do is that they study something, they learn about something, and then they forget about it until right before the test and then they'll try to cram it and then you know it's already all this information is lost and that's not going to stick with you but if you do it with this sort of stepped approach then you're going to be flatlining out um, you want to make it even better um, more than 90 percent then at you know, one month later, go back and review it. And this stuff is yours. This is yours. Right? This, is, this is what research shows the best way to study. And that's that cool? something that I do try to build into the, the classes that, that I teach, but I don't think I ever had this, this specific research to back it up. But I mean, 
you know, the idea of, of you know, at the beginning of class, we learn this thing. And then at the end of class, we, we you know, do a review and do another example. And then, you know, uh, the next week I give a quiz. So hopefully they're studying that, you know, and the quiz is really to motivate the students to, to study it within the week. And then, yep. you know, for the test, we have, you know, a review, but, you know, it's really, I think that to have it more targeted is not just like being ready for the test, the quiz, but as doing the repetition so that you'll, re so you'll learn it for life. That's, I'm going to definitely, definitely uh, uh, bring my, um, uh, you know, to, to put that in front of my, my students in future semesters and have them stay. Yeah, well, and then, then, then when we kind of metacognitively, metacognitively discuss that and use it as a deliberate strategy, right? So, you know, it's now for time for Ebbinghaus Rep 1, right? Set the clock for Ebbinghaus Rep 2, yeah. Yeah. right? And, um, and that it completely changes the way it's, it's so different than the standard model of study, mm -hmm. which is get all the information, then do nothing with it until some point later, when, you know, later on in the semester, you're, oh, there's going to be a test, we'd better study. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think in academic situations, also, I think that, that, I mean, I can't speak to what's what's being taught in schools these days. I don't know what the kids these days are learning, but you know, when I was in, when I was in middle school, high school, I, there was a little, we had a little bit of discussion about your learning style and, you know, ways of studying, but very, no, there was very little like anybody teaching me how to study, you know, I mean, I, it was, you know, and, and I don't know that students nowadays, like by the time they get to me in college, I don't know that they, know how to study or or, or if, and if they've ever learned that at any point or discussed that in school I don't think they, I don't think they implemented um, and you know so this, this idea that different kind of studying might actually be useful for you in different ways I think is, is is very new to them but but one thing I think is an interesting component of this this whole thing is um, you know like learning a skill versus learning just a fact like the the, the capital of Ontario um, just maybe maybe that too, but like learning a skill, like you know, if I if I, I can teach you how to solve an algebra problem right now, and you can solve that algebra problem, and maybe you can review that in an hour, and you can solve that algebra problem again. But the way that you're really going to learn it is if I put a new and slightly different kind of problem in front of you, and there's that like you know outside of the comfort zone thing, and then you have to figure out how to adapt those techniques and that logic to apply the, to the new situation. I think the same thing here with me trying to draw these owls because I've been in looking, watching the, your, these classes and attending these classes on, on drawing birds and all these different components of this whole process. Um, and I, you know, it, I, and the thing is, is you can watch somebody who knows what they're talking about explain to you very clearly how to do right. this thing. At the end of that, you feel like you know how to do that thing. And then when you go and you're faced with actually dealing with that same problem or a similar problem in the wild and no one's there to help you, you realize, oh, wait. I don't actually know how to do this and you have to figure out and so that's that's kind of the situation I I was in with like oh wait this owl is put together in a different way and I'm seeing it from a different angle than all these other birds yeah. Yeah. and I have to figure out how to how to like find a way to do this before it moves or figure out what to do if it doesn't move and uh you know so like I you know I I like when I did that little sort of like weird kind of vaguely bird-shaped thing with a shoulder bar thing that, that I that I did in my, my journal I was sort of very conscious of like, okay, I'm putting this in here and I, I'm not gonna feel bad that it doesn't look anything like a real bird because I'm literally just putting it in there so that I'll remember what the field marks are that I can see so that I can try and figure out what it is later. And, and that's okay. And the next time that I have to draw a bird that I only saw for a couple of seconds, it'll be better. And the next time I have to do that, it'll be better and so on and so forth. So, yeah. Yeah, um, I, I run in the same, I'm trying to learn how to play the ukulele. And I go to the lesson, right? I, I, I sit there in the lesson. I'm actually doing it with, with Amelia and Carolyn and I. We all are taking ukulele lessons at the same time from the same person. So we get our ukulele lesson. And then if I come home and go to like, wow, that was really cool. We learned, did a lot of stuff there. Um, and don't do anything with it that afternoon. Um, you know, the, the tendency is like, oh, I just had my lesson, so tomorrow I can practice, right? But then I've just totally missed out on the first two Ebbinghaus repetitions. So what I need to do, 
Yeah, no problem. Um, so what, what I want to do is I want to come home from that lesson. I want to sit down and do what we just did, right? But it's hard to make yourself doing that because in your brain, you're saying, oh, I just did my ukulele thing because we just had the lesson. We, no, we just did that. I'm fine, right? But if I wait even until the next morning to practice it, I'm then kind of going like, what were we doing? Like, how does it? But if I can get myself to like, let's do that again. And after dinner to pick up my uke again and to play with that, then the, whatever we did there is, um, is much more in my head. And it's actually really useful for me just to verbalize this because that's gonna help me sort of metacognitively being really aware of that. It's gonna help me after the next class to make sure I come home practice and then practice before I go to bed. And then the next morning we get up, the, th the, the myself and the two bears, we all sit down and we do our uke practice together. And then it's gonna be there much, much, much better. I feel like that's also that's also a good one in 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 a lot like drawing and, and painting and these kinds of art things i feel like there's definitely a um a uh like a, a sort, of, sort of sort of there there can be kind of a sort of a hump to get over a sort of a fear of i'm, I'm gonna do it bad you know yeah. like you know and and like you you you're doing your ukulele in, in front of your family. What if you play it badly? You know, so you have to you have to just like decide. No 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 no. They're practicing too, and the only way that I'm going to be able to play well is to play badly first. Okay, yeah. <laughs> you know, and 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 the same thing. You know, like it's not going to explode if you play it badly. You know, that's right. <laughs> and neither right. is your paper going to explode if you draw a picture that isn't quite up to you know Leonardo da Vinci standards or something. You know, so yeah. And and um, thing one and thing two are, are both. They're both much better than I am at playing the ukulele. So, you know, and so sometimes that's really frustrating, and sometimes it's relieving. But you're um, better than you were last week, though. I'm better than I was was last week. <laughs> um, you know, we're we're trying to. Um, we're trying to do this the, uh, as a trio to play Obla Di, Obla Da by the Beatles. And um, last week, I could get through the first phrase, but when you hit Obla Di, I collapsed. But today, um, I, um, I got all the way through that. And then I was having trouble with... Um, with the, when you get to the, in a couple of years, they had that part, right? Then, then that was my new struggle point. And so I'm going to, after our call here, I'm gonna have a little bit of lunch. I'm gonna play it again and work on the things that I was, I was, I was working on. And, um, you know, it's, 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 it's building, it's building. So I need to put in, um, I need to put in um, finger picking miles like Kate's putting in her, uh, her, her pencil miles. And that's how we build any skill. Okay. Oh, Ole, let's check out these. Um, let, let's uh, hold on, check this out. Oh, yes. <laughs> and that's on the envelope. Oh, wait, wait, hold on. I, it I is, to... yes. It's not my best envelope drawing. Um little out of practice, but also doing wings that are foreshortened at certain angles is always tricky. So, yep. you know. Oh, it, the, the, the body sort of is rotated differently on each one because of the way the wings are, are held too. Wow. That's and also yeah. compositionally, it's really cool. So you're dealing within this cropped format of the back of the envelope. And you know, I've loved this as a medium because I was in a long distance relationship for a long time. And every week I would send a letter with a painting on the back. And at that point I wasn't really doing any other art. And that's kind of what kept me doing art all through college. Um, when I didn't really have time for it. That was like the one thing I prioritized to do it for. So, yeah. That's cool. That's really, really fun. Ah, oh, that's, that's inspiring. Honestly, you have to work things into your schedule or it doesn't happen and like, set aside time for it. Can, 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 I, can I admit something, speaking of that? Here, this, this, this is my, this is the first, I, half of this is what you guys have been seeing starting in like February. You, you saw this in February. Um, 
this is this is my nature journal prior to that just 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 to show yeah um, because yep. I, I i would go out and i would take lots of photos and i would come home and i would take some notes and then i put them in and, I'm, and now and then i'm gonna i'm gonna i'm gonna do the drawings and things and it was a great plan except that then i get behind and then i get more behind and then i would feel like well now i can't go take it out in the trail because i need to have space for all the stuff that i haven't put in the journal yet and so it was just a getting behind so finally i basically said this year okay i'm i'm um gonna leave some spaces just in case and I'm just going to go and I'm going to go outside and it's cold out, but I'm going to find the first thing that's interesting. I'm going to go, I'm going to paint it. If I don't put something in the journal, then mm. it won't happen. So I've been really trying to just build the practice of it, it goes in here when I'm outside looking at something. And if it doesn't, then I don't worry about it. I'll go out next time. And it doesn't matter if I'm in a great position to make a beautiful piece of art or if I just yeah. had some pencils and I'm trying to sketch something as quickly as possible, it's going to go in the journal when I'm out there or it's not going to happen. So, yeah. yeah, <laughs> I, just... yeah and I, I've done pretty well. I've got this much, this much of nice. actual stuff I've been doing. So, um, it's so hard to make the judgment call of if to bring the camera or to leave the camera because I'll bring both the camera and the journaling supplies and I notice I don't pick up the journaling supplies I keep the camera out the entire time. So yeah, I'm gonna try and get better at that I got a journal that will fit in my bag a bit better and this one I'm this summer I'm just like gonna broken habit of, try and of fill it. camera yet because I've been doing a couple things that I have that I have doing from a photo that I've taken, but having ha having filled in, having done a lot live when I'm there has given me more motivation to then put something, you know, than, than to continue in it. Because I do, I do like sometimes I, oh, I want to draw a beautiful butterfly. And I'm sorry, these guys are the size of my thumbnail and I can't get close That's enough amazing. To, to look at them that closely. On their so this was actually out, actually this was sitting in the car because it started to rain. Um, but, and this was actually out on the trail, but then I filled in the actual butterfly from the photo later on, because these, mm -hmm. they're, they're this big and they're so tiny and cute and they come out in, in, in April and they're one of the first butterflies oh, that didn't overwinter as an adult hard. and they're amazing. And I love them because they look like just these little tiny brown things and they're not even noticeable or interesting. But then when you get really close to them, they're so intricate. And although you can't see the picture, they got hairy eyeballs, so. <laughs> <laughs> so just, yeah, so, so I, I'm definitely, I'm like changing my practice as of this year. And I think your journal pages it. are so beautiful, Susan. I mean, thank you. I'm, I'm, trying, I'm, 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 I'm trying, I'm trying to like do the. And, and you know, your curiosity, like you, you, you'll kind of go in, get into, go down these rabbit holes, like you'll be into hairy eyeballs and that, that will pull you off onto one sort of track of investigation. And then you will get into um, uh, the, uh, the skunk cabbage, right? And all those mysteries. And it's really fun to see your, this, this sort of playful curiosity um, and engagement with the world. It's so important. And what a, what a lovely part of being a human being. Well, there's just cool things in nature. What are we supposed to do? Not look at them? I mean, <laughs> yeah, but but just think of how easy it is not to, to 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 stop observing at the point where our brain says, "Okay, I think I understand what's going on." But but if you to pierce that veil, we need a tool. I think the journal is the best tool for that. So, I this has been a really fun conversation, but I'm going to to be bringing it to a close in just a moment. I need to 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 bounce for another engagement. Um, before I do, um, Avea, is it all right if I bring you back on? I'd like to bring back on our mad botanist. Um, hey, I'd love to hear your thoughts about uh, that, uh, the, the stewardship that we saw on Susan's page there and recording that and any last closing thoughts that you had for the community. Um, well, first of all, I think that you did the people just fine. I think they were amazing, actually. Um, and I like that because it shows the community that you were doing that with. Um, and so just major props to you for going out there and doing it. Um, I love that you put it into your nature journal. And that's another thing is that even if we wind up doing some stewardship and it doesn't get into our nature journals, we still did it. 
So that's the thing to remember about each thing that you do. The good thing about putting it into your nature journal though, is that then you look back and it almost feels like a more concrete memory because yeah. you put it in there. So whatever that is. And another thing is, hey Kat, I appreciate something about Kate, about, about Ray Bonto, about um, the younger Jack, and of course you, you too Jack, and about Susan is that all of you and our pen, all of you are putting in the pencil miles. All of you showed us lots and lots of pages of you all practicing and doing this. So I want to give all of you props for that. And all of you are really, really inspiring to the rest of us for that. So um, just keep on doing what makes you happy, um, I guess is my closing word. So thank you. And thank you. So friends, you all take care. Um, be kind. Uh, be kind to yourself. Be kind to the earth. Be kind to each other. Uh, we can do this. Somehow we're alive and we're sentient and we have, we have the capacity to, to, to celebrate this earth together. Let's make the most of that. And um, until we meet again, um, be well and thank you all.